So now, we spent a little time together last night. You know a couple things about me, and so you should be prepared. As your faithful leader has said, I am here indeed to cause mischief. <laughs> so what I'd like to know is if you had a first finger, and it is working, would you put it up and do this? Okay. All right. I think we have close to 100%. Very, very nice. So I need a volunteer who is willing to do that. <laughs> hey, there's one. Thank you very much. One of our deacons, newly installed deacons. Come on down, finger and toe. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I should have been more specific in my request. Share for you and put you on the other side of this. You do. And there's a little button right there. It does mean you get a front row seat. Even better. So I want you to notice that close to 100% of the folks in this room had the capacity to help. Yes? Close to 100% of the people in the room had the capacity. You had the ability, you had the skill, you demonstrated the ability and the skill. But when the question was asked, who will use that gift? for the common good, was there 100%? 80%? 70%? Not even 40%! Because simply having the gift and the capacity doesn't always lead us to serving. There are many in this room who have the gifts and graces to be leaders. We have the ability, we have the capacity, we have the skill to do the work of leading others. And yet when the call goes out, who will do this? We go. <laughs> so the call to visionary leadership is even more of a challenge because we're saying there's a particular kind of leader that is needed for the church as we move forward. Now, you all are here in the room and you recognize that my volunteer, remind me of your name, volunteer, Melinda, you all here, you know that Melinda volunteered on the spot, so anything that goes wrong in this presentation, you should hold me accountable and not Melinda. So I'd like you to give it up for my fabulous volunteer so far. Your work. 
the drum roll. It was the excitement of the moment. I understand. All right, third time is the in charge. Here we go. Drum roll, please. Conference 
is perpetually envisioning new ways to share best practices for mission and ministry. Now, I have just one question to start. When you heard those four things, and heard them as a call from the faithful leader, was there anybody in the room aside from me who wondered, I don't know if I can do that.
Each of those names were given to me because of specific circumstances, particular things that were happening in the life of my family. I am Davita Del McAllister because my father's name is David. Del is my grandmother's name, maternal, and all of my first cousins share that same middle name. And my mother is very insistent that my father's name is not David. And therefore, I am not to be called Davida. Mine is David. David. Bishop, I got the name when my sister's husband died unexpectedly, when they were married for just three years after a vacation in Florida. My family never really understood me as a minister until he transitioned. And all of a sudden, the youngest one in the family was the one who's providing care, praying, ministering to my mother and my older sister, who had always been the lead. In that moment, I became mission. And when my mother calls me that today, she's expecting something very particular of me. This is how I see the call of God. There are times when what God is calling me to feels like Jehovah is saying, Shabita, I want you to do this. Man, I'm so happy to do this thing. It's going to be so easy. I'm going to be so excited. I am grateful that God asked little old me to do it. And sometimes, when I hear God say, Davita Del McAllister, mm -hmm. and my back gets straight, and my face gets stirred, and I know I gotta say yes whether I feel like I can do it or not. But every so often, I hear God call me Bishop. And I'm being called to be and do something more than I believe I can do. I'm being called to be just a little more Christian than I think I am. So I have a question for you. Pretty simple. What names have you been called? Might be nicknames from your childhood. They may be love names from a partner or a significant other. They may be the name that your child calls you or your sister or brother or the folks at your job. But I want you to take a moment and turn to a neighbor and tell them, what names have people called you? I should have mentioned at the beginning that this keynote was something we were going to do together. <laughs> but I don't believe that there are there's a single expert. I think we all have something to offer. Would you do that for me? Are you willing to help out? <laughs> no, this side is like, I don't know, it's after lunch. You're asking a lot. <laughs> Finish eating, it's morning in here. Look, say what you got to say and move off the stage. Would you give me a shot? Would you do this for me? Yeah. Yes? All right, good. So, what names have you been called? Turn to someone on either side and tell them. What names have you been called? <laughs>
Shabita. Bishop. My friends call me Day, which is short for Devita. But I've been called other names. I've been called the N-word. The folks I didn't know driving by in a car and I was going just slow enough for me to see the people in it, but just fast enough not to be able to mark in my mind. I've been called the D word, which some of you may not know. It's a term that's used for same gender loving people who are women. Not by a stranger, but by a member of my own family. Screaming it from the doorstep of my own house. I've been called the B word, a name that gets used for women when they're too confident, too mouthy to sure of their own strength by children that I served in the inner city community. What are the other names that you have been called? Now I know we're in church. Some of these names can be hard to say out loud, and you may, like me, choose to name them with just the first letter. But each of us has been called something other than a child of God. Something about ourselves that we weren't quite sure about. Someone used it, turned it, and named us by that insecurity. This requires the kind of vulnerability that our leader has demonstrated for us to go to that place that is uncomfortable and to say out loud, this is a name that has been given to me. Are you willing to do it? Yes. I invite you now. Just as you did for Say to me, 
It's not what folks call it. It's what you answer to. And she said that to me because she couldn't control the world in which I live. She wanted me to understand I can control myself. And I answer to child of God. And when I answer to child of God, it creates that kind of energy, that excitement, that enthusiasm, and it creates just a little bit of discomfort. Because when someone calls me a child of God, when I acknowledge my role as a child of God, I'm also signing up to do the impossible. I'm agreeing but to try things that other folks say you shouldn't try. I'm agreeing to be uncomfortable for the benefit of the common good. I am agreeing to surrender what works for me so that the body of Christ is better. When have you been called to do or be more than you thought you could. Was it in a sermon? Was it in a conference minister's address? Was it your child asking you to explain something you'd said or done? Was it a spouse calling you back to the covenant you made? What have you been called to be more? To do more than you thought you could do. If you thought of something, raise your hand. A couple of us are still mulling it over. Sometimes it takes a minute. Oh, there's a new hand. There's one. A couple more sneaking up around the sanctuary. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you to do now, right? Right? Tell them, tell somebody. Turn around and tell somebody that time you were called to do and be more than you thought you could be. visionary 
military leaders call us to do and be more. And we're left with having to decide if we're going to do it. It's a scary thing to ask for, to pray for a visionary leader. It's a scary thing to say you're going to spend the entire weekend thinking about visionary leadership because you are setting yourself up to be uncomfortable. To do some things that you haven't done before and to be called out to do things that you may legitimately say, I can't do that. That's what visionary leaders do. They call us to be more and do more. And if you are like me, sometimes being called to do more and be more is just inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already doing enough. I do a lot and I got a list I can work down. If you give me two minutes and a bag of chips, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> A visionary leaders. They hear the voice of God whispering to us that nothing is impossible with God. And they take the risk to stand in front of us and to declare, child of God, do it. Do the thing that you don't think you can do. Have the conversation in your church you don't believe you can have. Make the pledge to support that is just beyond what is easy to say yes to. Decide to engage in the conversation that may cost you a few friendships. Visionary leaders. Start off being loved, and then the people look at them kind of sideways. <laughs> so I have one last question. <laughs> Who's willing? Thanks be to God.